St. Paul's Cathedral. Its stones bear witness to the sublime stories of an old country. It was here that the funerals of Nelson and Wellington, of Churchill and Thatcher were held. But in October 2011, a very different story was playing out in this churchyard. A group of protesters had set out to occupy the nearby London Stock Exchange. They found their way blocked by the police, so they decided to occupy St Paul's instead. They were part of a global movement which that month ran sit-in protests in an astonishing 951 cities in 82 countries. The demonstrators were angry, and they had reason to be. Governments had responded to the banking crisis four years earlier with taxpayer-funded bailouts. The sums involved were astronomical. In Britain, the government spent a trillion pounds propping up the banking system. In the United States, Forbes magazine put the total cost at $4.6 trillion. Where did the money go? No one knows. Who has it now? No one knows. But we do know one thing. We know that the tax system was used to expropriate low and medium income people in order to rescue some very wealthy bankers from the consequences of their own mistakes. No wonder there were demonstrations. I happened to be passing St Paul's at the height of the protest, and I stopped to talk to the activists. A couple of them recognised me, and what followed was, for me at any rate, very illuminating. All the protesters, without exception, assumed that, as a right-wing politician, I must have backed the bailouts. When I pointed out that the bailouts had been ordered by a Labour government, and that pretty much the only opposition at the time had come from small government types like me, they flatly refused to believe me. Guys, I said, you may not like free marketeers, but there must be at least two things that you know about us. We don't like nationalisations, and we don't like subsidies. What makes you think that we, of all people, would support the fire-hosing of public money at failed businesses? But they were having none of it. Everyone knew, they said, that right-wingers were for the rich, so of course we must have sided with the bankers. That basic misunderstanding, which goes way beyond Occupy protesters, explains the political upheavals of the past decade. It explains why people have lost confidence in a market system that is delivering unprecedented rises in living standards for everyone, rich and poor. Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, Syriza and Podemos, Kurt Wilders and Marine Le Pen, they are all, in their ways, delayed reactions to the bailouts. If people think that the market is a racket, a way for the rich to exploit the poor, they will vote for candidates who promise to tear down the system. So let's set this out clearly. Whatever else they were, the bailouts were not capitalism. In a capitalist system, bad banks would have failed and their profitable operations bought out by more successful rivals. Bondholders, shareholders, and in some cases depositors would have lost money, but taxpayers wouldn't have contributed a penny. Anyone who's worked in journalism recognises when a story has gone beyond the point of correction. That moment passed a while ago with the idea that the banking crisis was caused by deregulation. But it simply doesn't match the facts. With the possible exception of nuclear power, it's hard to think of a more regulated industry than financial services. And the regulation had become tighter and more prescriptive in the run-up to the crash. In the United States, the total amount spent on financial services regulation rose from $190 million in 1960 to, in constant prices, $2.3 billion in 2008. The Securities and Exchange Commission saw a 76% budget increase during the Bush presidency, that is, in the eight years running up to the crash. This additional regulation wasn't just useless, it actually contributed to the problem. When people are told that someone else is on top of the risk, they feel that they can relax. But it turned out that the regulators weren't on top of the risk at all. 
they manage to create all sorts of unintended consequences without the intended consequence. They were using a sledgehammer to miss a nut. Intrusive regulation tends to replace a culture of conscience with a culture of compliance. Instead of asking, is this a sensible thing to do? People ask, is this within the rules? Smaller businesses can't afford to keep up with all the new rules and regulations. Only large firms with big compliance departments can do that. Startups are kept out of the market, existing firms merge. In other words, it was excessive government regulation that created the too big to fail phenomenon in the first place. What's the answer? Instead of trying to create a regime where banks can't fail, we should encourage one where a bank can fail without causing a disaster. We should be facilitating demergers and diversification, lowering the barriers to new entrants. And there should be no question of rescuing failed banks. Let them carry their own losses. Give people more responsibility. It makes them more responsible.